thank you guys for uh, attending this session and uh, just to introduce ourselves quickly and give some background as well on uh, why we chose to present on this topic. Um, so I'll introduce Lucas. So he is actually the healthcare technology manager at the VA Southeast Network, uh, and that actually caters to veterans in Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina. And it's uh, the third largest VA network. And Lucas, in his role, he actually provides guidance and expertise to facility leaders and leads a team with oversight of over um, you know, assets worth over $515 million. And uh, he's been in this role for several years and also was stationed at several VA facilities in Arkansas, Texas, South Carolina, and Georgia. He holds a bachelor's uh, in biomedical engineering and a master's in health informatics. And he's also a member of Amy's Technology Management Council. That's how I actually got to know him, by the way. And his team was awarded uh, Technicians Department of the Month in March of 2020. And you are a local uh, resident of Atlanta, and he enjoys spending time uh, outdoors with his wife and two children. Could we maybe dim the lights in the front? Is that possible? Yeah, you know, this is the one. Maybe just punch the lamp. No. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it was yeah, blinding. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah he's got it. it okay. Ooh, yep, yeah, nice. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. And, I mean, that's fine. If you guys are okay with that, we're comfortable. You see it? Yeah, wait, yeah. that's solid. Okay. Then. And I have the pleasure of introducing Priyanka. So, uh, Priyanka is the Senior Director of Customer Success at SMLE. Prior to SMLE, Priya served as the Compliance Program Director at Banon Health, Compliance Manager at Intermountain Health, Clinical Technology and Biomedical Engineering Analyst at Stanford Healthcare, Clinical Engineer at Stanford Children's Health and Stanford University. She is a Research Advisor for BME undergrad and grad students at San Jose State University and BMS College of Engineering. She is an active member of ACCE, Amy, H. Isaac, and Hims while serving on several committees. She was the recipient of BIMT Best Article Awards in 2015, 2017, 2017 Amy Young Professional Award, 2018 Med Wrench Guru, 2020 ACC Professional Achievement and Technology Award, 2020 Doctoral Student Paper Award. She was awarded a fellow status in Amy in 2020 for her contributions to the H. Janet Priya holds an MS from San Jose State University and a BS from this Vesperia Technological University and is pursuing a doctorate degree in strategic leadership and healthcare administration. She is a certified healthcare technology manager, Six Sigma lean professional and change manager specialist. Priya currently serves as the ACC president and is a member of AC's Amy's technology management executive council. So I have the pleasure of serving her. Whenever I read Priya's by, I always wonder what I've done with my life so far. So. <laughs> Well, you know, when you're an immigrant, sometimes you have to do a little bit of work, right? <laughs> and I say that with good faith, actually. So again, uh, just a good uh, disclaimer here. One, we're not experts in diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. We've just read about a lot of that because we're working on a um, you know, side project with Amy. And at the same time, any opinions presented in this session is our opinion, not uh, you know, opinions of our employers again. And just a quick overview, and I want to give some background about why you know, we have this proposal, why we chose to present on this. In this uh, last year during Amy, there was a webinar with you know, 10 diverse professionals in the HDM, and that webinar was mainly to discuss how their career progression has been at the field, what are some of the struggles they face, and how it actually relates to diversity and inclusion. And one of the you know, key takeaways with that was there was a lot of uh, you know, equity challenges among females in this profession. There wasn't a whole lot of balance between you know, the male and female population and HDM. Um, so initially, while submitting this proposal, that was my part to focus on the challenges female leaders face and all of that. And then you know, we started reading more about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we thought, you know, it's actually more than just race, gender, or you know, um, you know, specific abilities of individuals. So let's actually expand the topic and just look at what are some of the challenges that we do face in our profession related to this topic, and what are some of key points that we can share with the audience, something that they can take back to their organizations, implement, find out, you know, collective opinions of their team members and such. 
So one, we will, you know, we make this more of an interactive session, not just a lecture, right? At the same time, we want to look at what are some of the challenges you're facing with having that diverse team, getting good at, uh, you know, individual opinions, and then what sort of opportunities you think with your team members as well as staffing, which um, quite honestly, the last two years has been number one concern with CC. So we touch upon a lot of those topics, but initially it started off with just talking about you know the challenges that female leaders face in healthcare as well as in leadership works. But over time, we've actually expanded on that. So Lucas, why don't you get us started? Thanks. So uh, Bria just talked about you know, what is diversity, equity, inclusion, um, and so what is it specifically when we're talking about in Asian community? So diversity, um, we're trying to focus on bringing awareness to the field. To, to a whole group of populations, to every population. We'll go into more detail, but what I found in my outreach to schools and universities and just STEM events is that no one knows about HDI. We, we may think that we're a big community, but I, I found very little students or schools that actually know about the HDI field. So how can we increase awareness to those fields? Uh, and in the same vein there, uh, continue awareness, continue diversity with hiring, and make sure we're, we're offering opportunities to all the populations and then ensuring that you have diversity in your team. So once we get uh, the, that new population on board, how can we continue to you know, recognize, celebrate, and um, use that diversity to our advantage? Looking at equity and inclusion, those are, you know, once we bring those people on board, how can we focus on retaining them? And that's really where equity and inclusion comes in. So uh, as far as equity is concerned, making sure that everyone has equal opportunity to run our board. Um, making sure that your organizational mindsets and practices are focused on equity. Again, making sure everyone has the same opportunities, um, both when it comes to promotion and experiences and learning. And then with inclusion, making sure everyone gets to contribute, you know, making sure everyone has a voice at the table, making sure everyone has a chance to provide thoughts or feedback or solutions to your problems. Um, and then again, just how can you incorporate inclusivity into your business operations? The one of the parts that comes to my mind is, you know, how many of you were in the keynote or the right ago? And one of the statements that Brian made was, uh, you know, when you like the work and you like the people you work with, you have a good mindset. And then sometimes you don't like the work, but you still like the work because you like the people you work with. And that thought process is related to inclusive. You have that inclusive mindset. So regardless of how, you know, what complexities, challenges you have with the job, you still like the people you work with. And you're not just going to remain with that nine to five mindset. So that relates to you know having that inclusion and focusing on that retention of your team members as well. So um, just defining DEI, so diversity is the presence of differences. Uh, equity is promoting justice, partiality, and fairness. And inclusion is an outcome where diverse populations feel welcomed and participate to a full extent. We have a nice quote here from Lindsay Lunsford. Like a string of beads, it is our unique differences and intricacies that make us so appealing and attractive. We would not be as beautiful as we were all the same. It's the contrast and asymmetry that makes us worthwhile. So how many HD members in the room have had some sort of diversity equity and inclusion training in their organizations? Is, is that part of your annual training when you, you know, um, you have to do that to the uh, it's, it's a real big push in my organization right now over the last maybe two, three years where it's always been present, but now it's among the forefront of what we're doing. And how, how, how often have you heard about you know, diversity, inclusion, equity, and especially in the last two years? You know, how, how it's been getting more attention than it was in the past. It's just scary uh, that some people can misunderstand what it means. Mm -hmm. uh, say they can influence this question. I mean, it's too broad of a topic to just focus on, you know, like a couple of focus areas, if you will. So when you talk about diversity, it's really do you have different opinions, different people from different backgrounds, different cultures, ethnicities in your team, and why that's actually useful to be getting to that. Equity is again, regardless of the job levels in your organization, do you value the opinions of it? You could walk around the hallway and you have someone from 
you know, another team, you probably don't know them, and you know, like, why is this person actually giving me suggestions on what HTM should be? That's again, you not having that entity there, and inclusive, you know, um, taking that feedback in a right manner. Inclusion is again one of, regardless of what your diversity status is, what your you know, job role is, etc. You make everyone in the team outside of your team feel welcome. You, you, know, you don't have any partiality to their opinions all of that, and you make sure that you have full participation from everyone on your team. So when when you are the leaders in this room, and I know you are in a leadership position as well. So if you are rolling out the new process, how much of that um, how much of that process development do you go back into like feedback with your teams? How much of their input do you have when you're rolling out the new process? Are you asking me? Yeah. Uh, it depends on depends on what's being rolled out. If it's something that I have control over, then I do bring the feedback of my team into into account. Uh, whether I bring it up at a daily safety huddle or um, in an email or kind of just open conversation. If it's something that's a little bit more top down, then where maybe my team doesn't have. You know, I have a pretty diverse team, um, and if they don't have if their say doesn't mean anything, then they wouldn't have as much input into that particular uh, decision. Okay. We're a larger system, so we have corporate hierarchy. Okay. All right. So uh, we wanted, and we liked this image here because I think when we talk about diversity, you know, it's easy to sort of focus on gender or race or age, but really all of these different spectrums and subspectrums, um, how people communicate, you know, their Myers-Briggs tests, uh, their experience, their background, their education, all of these things feed into someone's identity and thus their diversity. So you know, when we're talking about diversity, we're not just talking about race, age, gender, et cetera. We're talking about all of these items, life experiences that feed into uh, someone's identity. And how can we incorporate all of those experiences and values into how your organization operates? I think for the most part, uh, you know, when we have learned about diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion, we have just focused on the primary aspects. You know, um, until I think a few days ago, we didn't even know about the rest of the categories, right? Uh, but then, when you're talking about inclusion, especially, you know, the secondary, the organizational, uh, you know, aspects, the cultural aspects, all of that factors in. So, for example, I mean, uh, let's take now during the month of Ramadan, right? How many of you know, you know, individuals observing the fast and all of that? So, those are some practices that you have to respect to be inclusive of that. And there are instances where if you have team members, you know, observing fast, all of that, you might want to accommodate work schedules as well. So, that's being inclusive of their cultural practices. So, a few things that we wanted to go over. Yeah, so <clears throat> why does diversity, equity, inclusion matter? So, you know, if we're talking about recruitment, if we're talking about recruiting all populations. You know, we, we're struggling right now across the board, like Priya mentioned, staffing is a huge focus, especially over the past few years. So if we're excluding certain populations from our recruitment or outreach, we're decreasing the size of our talent pool when it comes to recruitment or to finding staff. So, you know, DEI allows us uh, to reduce that bias in the recruitment process and increase uh, the size of the population, the nets that we're using to try to find candidates. Uh, it improves team performance. So we all have very diverse customer bases, um, you know, very diverse populations to work with. So how can we match those populations? So if we have a diverse team, we're able to better interact with our customers, better relate to them, better communicate with them, you know, almost uh, having more tools in our toolbox to help meet their needs. So having a diverse team improves performance uh, and improves productivity because we're more able to utilize our tools to better meet problems. And more innovative solutions. So as we mentioned, and I don't want to go back to that previous slide, we have to through all the transitions again, but you know, every single one of those bullet points that you saw on that previous slide is what brings innovation. You know, it's not that, uh, you know, person that's been in the field for 30 years, or it's not that new tech person. It's, it's the entire team that bring ideas. In. It's their entire identity and background that brings solutions and perspectives uh, to your department. And so, 
all of those things help improve decision making and problem solving. And then finally, a sort of a trickle, a trickle down or secondary effect. You know, if your team, if you have a fully staffed team that is performing better and bringing better solutions, you're obviously going to see better uh, financial performance within the organization. So, a few interesting points here. So, in 2021, Amy actually led a you know, survey, uh, by the HDM salary survey, actually, and that was also published in 247 as well. And about 7,000 HDM professionals actually responded to the survey. And uh, some interesting statistics from that is 46 percent of the 7,000 people that responded were 50 years or older. And then only 33% of the respondents were below the age of 40 years. What that tells us, I mean, we have, uh, I mean, we've actually heard about this quite, uh, quite a while now. Uh, almost 50% of our workforce is nearing retirement in the next five to 10 years. And we already have a shortage of incoming professionals. We have that short pipeline. So one, if you're not aware of diversity, equity, inclusion, and you're not casting a wider net with, you know, who we want to recruit into the group, what sort of talent we want to bring and how we want to train that talent, we're going to end up with much worse numbers than this. So 33% of the respondents out of 7,000 were below 40 years. And when you talk about salaries, we saw salaries grow in both areas, management as well as non-management roles. Uh, but then one particular area that actually saw a very competitive salary and continues to be one is among energy engineers. So imaging engineers where one, the acuity of the problems that they have to deal with is a lot higher. And second, the salaries are also much uh, you know, higher in that. At the same time, how many BMETs, how many entry-level technicians are getting the opportunity to get into imaging groups? Or even you know, existing staff members getting the opportunity to train to then service imaging the you know, equipment. I actually had a very interesting conversation with another HDM leader last week. And uh, one of the successes he had, he had a BMET one with one year of experience. So just straight out of uh, you know BMET school, one year in the workforce. And that person was showing a lot of interest in learning about imaging devices. And he was actually sent to a very expensive MR uh, training. And because they won, they did have a lot of spend on MR uh, systems. And this person comes back from training and he's been, uh, had a job you know, still for about a year. And they saved most of uh, close to about eight thousand dollars just on first response and uh, you know regular service calls were going to the record directly. And this is a BMET just two years in the workforce. Used to be a BMET one went to a factory training was you know, trusted by his leader to get that opportunity. And now is actually making a lot of improvements in the organization. So one again that imaging BMET that continues to be a great field, you know great salaries everything, but then. Um, how many people are even getting the opportunities to train on imaging equipment? And uh, the good thing is 71% of the 7,000 still recommend the profession, so that's great. Um, I don't know why the rest of the people don't recommend. I didn't see any data published about that and the reasons. So they don't, they don't get to come to the conferences. So, that's <laughs> yeah. so that'll be something interesting to assess and get that positive feedback as well. Um, just breakdown of the staffing. So out of the 70,000, again, the majority, 70% is still being met. Uh, we do have 13% of clinical engineers, uh, mainly involved in project management, risk management activities, and equipment planning. And then 5% in cybersecurity, and that continues to be a growing uh, rate within our field. And then 8.5% in management. And there are a few others, you know, just project managers, which is 1%. Uh, five percent administrative staff, and then you have some other professions as well. And when you look at this breakdown, uh, if you compare to the type of projects HDM uh, are getting, what sort of responsibilities HDM departments have, and then what the workload is between clinical engineers, biomedical equipment technicians, with cybersecurity, um, these percentages actually seem a bit off when you do a first look at it. You know, with the kind of projects that's involved in HDM. Uh, but it would be interesting to actually look at what organizations responded, what is their sort of responsibilities, and uh, why the structure is this way. Um, again, diversity is one. Uh, looking at the survey, reading about the different statistics, uh, one of the things is you know diversity continues to be untapped. Uh, out of the 7,000 professionals that responded, uh, if you look at the ratio with race in mind, Eight and a half percent are black or African American. Sorry about that typo there. 
and then 7.7 percent are Hispanic. And uh, what was very interesting and mind-boggling to me personally was only 11 percent identified as female. And among the managers that responded in the survey, and if you look at management, I think it was 8.5 percent uh, in uh, management votes. Only 14 percent of uh, managers were female. And uh, you know, even in that, about 60 percent of the managers were over 50 years. 15 and a half was over 60 years, and the overall, 47 percent of the workforce was over. So when you look at this, uh, you have a lot of imbalance, you know, racial inequity, uh, just gender inequity as well. And um, what was also interesting in the study was uh, organizations, and I think there were 71 organizations that responded, if I remember correctly. Eight and a half percent of open vacancies, and 33 percent, that's one third of the organizations, said that they took about two to four months to fill a vacancy. And for some of the roles, they had more than four months to fill a vacancy. Um, you know, so that tells you that one, we're not doing a great job you know, with the recruitment, yes, you know, and we're not being creative with our recruitment strategies as well. And if you look at the available populations, you know, for professionals in allied health, you have students coming out of bioengineering, biomaterials, biomedical engineering, or even just other technical schools. Um, those are areas that we normally don't go up. We don't go to career fairs. We don't go to you know, um, any other community career fairs also. And then we don't participate. We don't talk about the HDMP. And one more thing that was very interesting, and I'll talk about this later, was um, you know, Amy has been doing some work with this topic. And we, uh, you know, we were writing to several other associations, like the National Black Association for Healthcare Professionals. There's a Hispanic Association for uh, Students in STEM field. And none of those associations ever knew about HD. And that was really sad. I mean, we're such a community, we're making so much difference in the medical field, but no one was even aware of HD. So that's when we used that really HD on a box presentation and you know talked about it to those associations as well, just to create that awareness of the field so that when they're trying those creative you know, recruitment strategies, we can actually reach out to those professions as well and sort of over the years improve those numbers. So with this, there are a few, you know, focus areas. Sorry, I put a lot of animation now. It's, it's kind of bad with the clicker. Right? So one, a uh, few things to understand here is one, we need more diversity among HTMPs. We need that balance, whether it's in the form of race, gender, you know, other secondary diversity uh, items as well. Um, second, we need awareness of the HTMP in other represented uh, populations. So different associations, and we can actually share a list of all of those associations we've been working with as well. Um, you know, doing those outreach activities, introducing the HTMP, you know, offering, say, internships or externships, participating in co-ops for students, that's something that we need to start doing. Um, again, even with existing staff, the last couple of years with all of the stress of the pandemic, we're seeing that even our existing staff is really not happy. Most of them have that nine to five mindset. They're working for a paycheck. Um, and over the years, you know, people in the field have lost that satisfaction to a certain extent where uh, they don't realize that they're making a great difference in, in people's life. And sort of that uh, value add component has gone, gone away because of the stress of the pandemic or whatever it is. So you need to increase that value component at the same time do more, more things so that you can retain your existing staff, make sure they're happy coming to work, and then also having the job satisfaction. And all of that will again lead to good productivity and financial performance, all of that. But then the human factor is what needs to be there at the moment. And all of this again relates to um, your job vacancy lines. And when you're looking at being at one position being open for two, four months. And then if you're talking with leadership position, people are struggling to fill that for like four, six months as well. Yeah, so one, we need to talk in that. A gap of talent across the spectrum. <laughs> the fact that two thirds yeah. of jobs take over two months to fill is in, and how can you operate with an organization that takes so long to, to fill those jobs? I was talking to another leader and he said, he has 40 person vacancies in his department. And it's been open for about a year and a half. Oh. So you can imagine almost more than one third of the department being on staff. And you can imagine the workload imbalance for existing staff. Yeah. And we see 
across my region, we have about a 25% vacancy. And that's not just the past two years, that's been historical. Over the past probably 10 years, we've averaged about 25% vacancy. So, you know, I've been in my role uh, just over two years now. How can we tap in you know, to DEI to help fill those needs? You know, what populations have we missed? Um, what have we not taken advantage of that's sitting right in front of us? How many of you actually, when you go out, you know, to seek hiring you know, new individuals, how many of you are expecting the individual to be shoveled in, to just be ready for the job on day one? Do you think that's a reasonable expectation? No. Sorry, I don't need to put you on the spot. Yeah. No, I know it's not reasonable expectation, but like what you're saying, everyone is short staff, everyone is being stretched thin. Uh, like now I'm hiring for a position, and I have a very strong candidate. He's great. But when I say strong, his personality is strong. He fits in well with the team, but he doesn't have the skills to hit the ground running. It's going to take time for us to train him technically, which is the easiest part of the career. Yeah. But I can't afford to hire him because I'm so much behind. I need someone to hit the ground running. Yeah. So I know it's not the optimal, yeah. but we we are in this situation that like you have 25% shortage. You can't think of okay, I'm, I'm going to fill it with 25 students and spend a year training them, then I'll be fine. You can't afford to do that, even though it sounds a great idea, but you have, you need help. And that makes sense from the need that you have. You want someone that is ready for the job. So probably you can afford a month of onboarding, not anything more than that, because you have that workload strain already. On the other hand, I'll give some perspective. One, I was hiring and I hired a few people as well. One, great with communication and everything, but then technically still ramping up, but I can still manage the workload. On the other hand, I have someone that is superb technically, that's doing great, but then very bad at communication and bad at work. So that's something in my personal leadership style, is something that's not going to work for me long term, and then leads to a toxic culture. So you need to balance one from a work and performance standpoint, what is optimal. And then from a cultural standpoint and like behavioral aspect, what's actually optimal for your team. So you have to really cast that wider and I'd see, okay, if I'm hiring a person that doesn't have the skills, what is the time I have? Can they build the skills in that time frame? And what resources do I have in my organization to help build those skills? Right? So you need to have that good onboarding plan so you can train the individual to be ready for the job. So I want to ask, uh, and it's part of, uh, of this, the diversity and recruitment. Um, I've always had, I mean, I've been thinking about this for a while, even uh, the TMC and at Amy, when we thought about it at the first session. Um, I think the, the worst thing we can do to diversity is to think about diversity and recruitment. And why do you say that? Because when we're hiring, we shouldn't consider any other aspects beyond the skills of the person you're interviewing. Once you start thinking, I have to hire uh, a male or a female, uh, a Middle Eastern or an Indian or an American, a, a black or white, uh, once you start thinking this way, then I think we're going in the wrong direction. We should be interviewing the individuals for strictly their skills. It doesn't matter who he is, how he identifies, or anything. If he's a good fit, then that's it. But doesn't unconscious bias come factor into when you're performing the interviews? Like, I mean, everyone's familiar with unconscious bias. Like, and you tend to want to hire somebody that's like you. Yeah. Even though you might be cognizant of it, it's still something you kind of have need to keep in mind. To change your job, if this is how it's saying. Well, it's not how I think. No, no, I'm saying that's proven in a study. As a leader, I know what you're saying and what you're talking about, but that's the failing leader, I would say. It's okay. not the problem with diversity, it's the problem with. The skills and the ability to deliver the results that you're expecting of that role, that should be your primary one. I have. That's very appealing. Right? The second one, where we say diversity in recruitment is. One, are you limiting yourself in that search pool to a certain set of candidates? Do you have bandwidth in your organization to reach out to a wider group of individuals that may be suitable for that job, that may have the skills for the job, or are you just limited to someone that you think or have that bias in your mind that will fit with it? Right? 
right? So, for example, I might say, uh, you know, I've heard about this one person, and in my mind, I might, and I'm thinking of hiring. So, I might be trying to reach out to just that one person and someone else in that connection, right? But in my mind, I'm actually being biased because I have secondhand information about that person's skill. I haven't seen anything firsthand, so I have a prejudice about what they can or cannot do. But without that bias in mind, if I cast a wider net and say, okay, let me see what's out there. I actually have a candidate now that comes from a completely non-technical background, was in um, you know sales and uh, was in communication and PR, that's actually doing great in his role. So in fact, earlier on when we were in the hiring stage, that person's resume was rejected because they're like, I don't see any technical stuff here. Mm -hmm. But talking to that person before, I was like, wow, he is great at communication. So if I'm up front with them saying, hey, these are the skills that I see that you are good in. Here are the areas that I think you need to focus on during your onboarding. That's going to be a great fit in the long run. So one, are you diversifying that experience itself during the course? Or are you limiting yourself to a certain set of candidates or just certain skills that, yeah, will be nice in the short term, but isn't going to help long term? So that's what we mean when you say diversity in the group. We're not just thinking, you know, like, I'm going to hire a female because I need to balance a ratio, a ratio number in my organization. I think if you go at it with that approach, you're going to be focusing on the numbers, not the people, and what, what you need to do. This is what I said. It's dangerous if you don't yeah. see diversity in the right definition of it. There's one of the things. So I went to school in India, right? And there's a reservation <laughs> system where the caste and also quotas when you get admission in your colleges and universities. And often what happened was people in the general category, that includes myself, we had only 10% of the seats. So when I took an exam to get into the engineering college, I had close to about 6 million students, and I actually got a rank of 1,191 among 6 million students. Despite that, the top five colleges I had to struggle to get in with the government sponsor, sponsorship because one, there was a reservation that was not available for the merit students. So when you think of numbers and filling in just a racial quota or a gender quota or anything, you're going to miss out on actually getting a large pool of candidates. So one, yeah, skills, all of that is important, but also look at are you having the opportunity or that you are. Or in some cases, you might have great candidates, but then they need limitation sponsorship. And your organization might say, I'm only going to use a sponsorship for managers at either level, not technician level. So as a leader, what chance do you have to make a difference and give this candidate a chance? Because they very well have the skills, but this is a paperwork sort of roadblock that you have. And I would, I would add on the, on the front end with hiring, you know, if you have a diverse team that is doing the recruitment, that is doing the resume review, that's doing the resume scoring, that's doing the interviews, you're going to have those different perspectives when it comes to what you value as an organization. You know, if it's just you and your techs that are doing the interviews or the same population that's doing the interviews, you again may miss something where you know someone with a sales background is, is actually sort of the best candidate. Um, so having those diverse views and populations throughout the recruitment process help you sort of see the big picture and identify, you know, best value at value add type things throughout the throughout the process and not just, you know, focusing on hiring a certain group. One of the things that's actually worked well for me when hiring technicians is uh, before when I when I saw the interview panel or the list of you know, people interviewing, it was just all leaders. There was no technician, there was no you know, being at one, two, or anyone, and you're hiring for a person that's going to work with those units, but you don't have their opinion at all. So over time, you know, we were able to change that process and say, okay, we have a BMET position someone's interviewing for. Let me have a BMET one, let me have a BMET three, and then I'll have the supervisor of that team, as well as another leader. So you have a very good opinion, you're diversifying that entire interview process, as well as giving the chance for that candidate also to evaluate you, because it's not just you evaluating the candidate. They need to evaluate you to see whether they're going to like working with you. Right? So that's you know, you're creating that diversity in that entire recruitment process, getting opinions both ways. I run a small, very small company at Port of Oregon. Part of our process uh, for, uh, interviewing is 
they go through the standard review with the exact same questions and find out what's going on with that person. But part of it, because we're small enough and we can do this, we then have that potential candidate over to our staff members and say you have one hour and you, you interview and you talk with them. And the feedback we get from them is quite astounding. I mean, usually about 100%, yes, we can work with this person. They both have the exact skill level, but just the, the being able to connect and uh, because teamwork is imperative in our company, that we really have to be able to work them up together. And, and it's interesting the feedback that we get. Yeah. You know, that's a great point. And I tell you, I have a personal experience when, well, on the other side of it as a new member of the team. So I actually interviewed for a job a few years ago and got the job as well. And my interviews were only the senior leadership. And what was happening was another person in the organization who was doing the same things that I was asked to do. And that person was kept in this art when they were interviewing me. And what happened was, I mean, the senior leaders were happy and I was happy I got the job. But once I started, then I had a lot of friction with this person. Almost to the extent was I was very comments, oh, you're just a new media, you're coming in fact to change all the things here. And you can imagine the amount of stress that adds because you're already in a new environment, you're trying to sort of build your feet there, and then you have, start having restrictions, which is not fair to the candidate or to the person that's you know been in the organization for so long. So, which is why I think involving the team and we're getting there, we can see how the culture fit or the behavioral fit, as well as the technical fit. All of that is going to help you create that long-term relationship, have that candidate stay in the organization as well, and then have a better work experience for everyone, not just bringing in new people without letting anyone know. And all of a sudden, go, oh, I have this desk empty next to me. I just have to share it with this random person I don't know. Right? You're going to end up with a lot of situations like that. Yeah, we. It's an excellent point, and we do something similar in our organization where we're hiring leaders and. Uh, even when we're not hiring leaders, we like to bring, you know, we'll have our technical representative on the panel or scoring resumes, but we'll also have a representative from one of the other, you know, possible support services, supply chain, IT, uh, something like that, and then someone from, the, you know, the clinical side, a nurse, um, you know, a medical technician or something like that. So we, we have a whole representation of, you know, every, every group that that person may be interacting with during the job has feedback based upon, you know, their, that sort of thing. So make sure they not only fit within our department, but within the organization. This one again, diversity among HTM teams. So there are some really good points, but some things we wanted to make attractive was one, um, how many of you actually have team members that aren't comfortable with public speaking, writing articles or coming to conferences? Yeah. yeah. One of my experience with that was um, one, you know, encouraging the staff to take risks and stretch assignments. And I was hoping to remember this when I was talking with Lucas yesterday. So, um, as part of my compliance role, something I started in the organization was a safety contest. So, you know, I would do audits around different facilities and then identify some improvements that need to be done. And then, often, you know, technicians would suggest how to improve, have great ideas. So, the safety contest was throughout the year. And we measured this on a quarter basis. Anyone that saw an issue in the department or even outside of the department, they had to submit an X1. So we'll talk about what the situation is, what the issue, what is the background of that situation, what is their assessment, and what do they recommend for fixing? Right? So just like it was a little tiny sheet, I think it was just a six by six or something. And they had to submit it. And you know, I was in a corporate office, so every month I would get those different ideas. And towards the end, um, the way that whole process improved the culture was one of getting all of these great ideas. So as a leader, you're even getting to investigate what is the technical level, what's the people skills of this person, what are the behavioral traits of this person, what actually is their thought process when they're identifying an issue and trying to improve that issue, and are they willing to work with a you know in a collaborative manner to improve something that's you know causing a deficiency, right? And uh, over time, people started getting motivated because there was someone that was hearing their ideas, encouraging them to now take lead, take charge, and make improvements. And then third thing, let's say there was like 10 different ideas in a single month. 
So we had an average of 20, 25 in a quarter, right? We would pick at least three or four, whichever was successful in the implementation. And then I would actually help that person submit like a really bright idea or an article to execution or something. So over time, the result of that was we had people from you know, the technicians or engineers, anyone that were really just working in the basement shops or just not coming out of the shops. All of a sudden, we are having the opportunity to recognize them on a national level. And that can be so motivating for the uh, you know, individual working in your organization. And that really one will encourage the staff to take risks, you know, come out there, talk about their work, take on those stretch assignments. And at the same time, they just created an overall, uh, I mean, a healthy competitive environment. It was an unhealthy competition, but in a very healthy way. So I, I even had some technicians like, yeah, I submitted like seven ideas, man, what did you do this one? You guys have some. So it was really nice that people started doing rounds more, talking to char charge nurses, everyone finding out what issues they experienced. And all of that was going on paper. So year end, when you're doing your audit of the department, you're evaluating where you need to. So all of those things stuck with it. And you can see the benefits for leadership as well as for your team members. And I think to, to reference the keynote again, you know, he was always talking about comfort zone. And you know, comfort, comfort zone breeds all sorts of things. It breeds complacency. So if we're, we're continuing to push our staff into things that they're not comfortable with or stretch assignments, pushing them, developing them. Um, we're not sitting still, we're moving forward. So we should always be looking to move staff forward and move the organization forward. So continue to push staffs and, and give them stretch assignments. So, so um, outreach, I, I think, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that when I do outreach, no one seems to know about HDI. And, you know, is that, can we trace that to now our issue with lack of talent or a short uh, talent pipeline to fill our vacancies? Um, so obviously doing outreach and talking to elementary school students is not a short term or medium term fix for our issue. Uh, but at a certain point, you know, we have to get out of the catch 22 of you know, not having time to do outreach or not wanting to do outreach or not wanting to invest resources into growing um, awareness of our community, growing awareness of the pipeline. So you know, how can we use outreach to our advantage? How can we get the word out there uh, to prospective HTM professionals, be they five-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 25-year-olds, Whatever the age may be, so getting planting that seed early. Um, well, one, um, you know, the really good success story here, and thinking back to one of the organizations I worked with. So they started reaching out to the local community colleges as well as high schools. So all the leaders. Um, one of the things I took from Amy, the TNC group, we have a um, you know commitment that every year we're going to do some outreach activities for high schools. So if you're a TNC Technology Management Council member, you have to do that. So kind of took that idea, introduced that into this organization, and they started working with the local community college. And over time, that introduction of HDM grew so big, that community college now has a HDM program. So now you're increasing that pipeline in that uh, region, geographical region as well. The other thing that was a benefit, so did that HDM uh, you know, in a box presentation to high school students, and we actually gave some internships for high school students. And one of the kids just was so brilliant in 3D printing and all. He actually had a 3D printer in his house, and during the pandemic, he actually helped out the patients in our organization. And it just turned out to be a wonderful, you know, uh, relationship with that uh, kid. And now he's actually a peanut one in the organization. Yes. You know, it's just worked out so well. Initially, it was just part time helping out with some things, shadowing people, helping them with uh, boxes, open equipment, or go deliver. Health and shipping receiving. And now that person's in a technician role, and over time he's actually interested in cybersecurity and IT. So now we're training the future cyber engineer now for HDM. So a lot of good success stories. I think there's numerous ones like this where people have talked about, you know, HDM to different communities, different STEM uh, festivals, events, and the thing. Or even just community fest. Like if you look at like, people who have that HOA in your, your housing community, you have job fairs over there. 
we'll go talk about this. You never know. There are so many IT professionals that are that will be suitable for HPL jobs. You know, so many people with mechanical, with you know, labor background that are suitable for HD. So does, does anyone have the outreach experience they want to share? Does anyone's organization do outreach or personally do it um, without? I'm partnering with junior achievements. Uh, I should be familiar with them. They, they tap into college and high schools and even intermediate schools. And even uh, I went to an elementary school one time. Um, so I, I was surprised. I was able actually to get a few people into uh, to go and study biomedical engineering because of that, like at least three. Uh, so it's kind of uh, rewarding when you see kids being kind of, wow, oh, what's this? You can do that? And they, to your point, no one knows about it, especially students in college or high school, because this is what it, it actually pays off. Because, like in high school, uh, he was so interested, he needed to come in and do an internship. We did that internship. And once he's done, he went, he started applying to colleges and universities. Unfortunately, uh, we are in a kind of almost rural area. So his high school and high school teachers told him, don't even bother, you're not going to get anywhere. But he was approved and uh, he went to Duke University. He studied by my engineering and like, oh, once you graduate, let me know, come back. So, uh, yeah, the outreach does pay off. We need to invest more time in the outreach. One of the things you know, in the ACC we can do is um, with any as well as ACC, there's student paper competitions. And every year you get such amazing submissions. Uh, but a lot of that now, when you look at the last two years, as we focused on developing some app to solve a medical issue, or it's like I got some equipment out of there and I did something in here for I found in you know, some other creative way to it. That's a great channel to tap into as well. Like these kids already know about the integration of medicine and engineering and technology. What can we really talk to them? Get in touch with the schools, talk about HDM. And so you're really adding into the outreach activities and expanding awareness on the field. Great points. This is going to be a fun one. I think uh, we've had so many pointers. Uh, you said 20-25% of your vacancy is still open. Another person said 40%, so more than one third of staffing. Um, any experiences here where, you know, what have you done to retain an existing staff, make sure that in that productive, happy, satisfied work environment? Yeah, them more. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's number one. People are definitely happy when you see a nice paycheck. When I hire people, kind of what you guys were talking about earlier is, I, I, I've had the opportunity to hire a lot of BMET ones over the last year or so. So we had a couple of two vacancies that you know the two moved on to other organizations or other career fields. Um, so I promoted my ones into twos and then hired new ones in. And you know, kind of going back to what you're saying, I hired for behavior, and then I'll teach them how to turn around. Like generally speaking, they'll come. They're coming with some kind of degree or some whether it's. Um, you know, electronics, biomedical, or in some cases even IT degrees, because we have to broaden what we're looking for in order to bring people into the field and just keep that pipeline going. Yeah. And I mean, well, one of the things I'm also focusing on in the industry, there's a lot of female students that say, you know, one, two years into college and they're realizing, you know, maybe medicine's not the thing. So, you know, there's one thing, spark the interest in HD. It's a very satisfying field, and I think on this note, don't cause too much harm. You have good job security as well. Um, you know, uh, it's a great, very satisfying field. So, and I think you have a really good story about great Greg. And well, I think, uh, like you mentioned, promotional opportunity is obviously an excellent retention thing besides just pay uh, in general. Um, but you know, we mentioned development, uh, p pushing your staff forward, keeping them out of their comfort zone. Uh, we talked about offering everyone the same opportunities. So is that uh, promotional opportunities? Is that detail opportunities? Is that supervisory experience? Or is that training? You know, I know a lot of my, and I've seen, you know, over the course of years, is every department has those one or two people that they lean on heavily. And, you know, all those people get the training. Those people get are usually the ones that get their input first. You know, so what about the rest of your staff? You know, if you rely on just those 
couple of people, you're really hamstring yourself um, functionally. But at the same time, you know, that's a dissatisfaction, I'm sure, for the rest of uh, your department that's not getting consulted for um, solutions, it's not getting training opportunities, it's not getting you know experiences to push them out of their comfort zone. So um, at the same time, celebrating and, and recognizing, you know, I, I, I think in our field, especially, people sort of see, people want to keep their head down and get their work done, you know, where we take pride in just sort of getting a job done no matter what it takes. Um, but I think it's also important to sort of take a step back, take your foot off the gas pedal and, you know, just decompress, recognize, celebrate up each damn week's coming up. So I think that's a great opportunity to, to do something like that. But, you know, back when I was a partner head, I always had, you know, we had monthly breakfasts at our staff meetings, and people thought it was hokey and silly. Um, but after a while, you know, people would come to appreciate it. You know, that 30 minutes of just sitting down at the table with your coworker and um, shooting the breeze, not necessarily talking about work, you know, having that 30 minutes just to decompress once a month made a huge difference. Um, you know, even if it's only 30 minutes a month. So I think just taking the time out to, to recognize um, staff and, and rest. And then uh, talking to staff about tasks or projects or duties that they enjoy. You know, what, what are some tasks that bring you, that you feel engaged with the organization? You know, is there certain things you do that you look forward to that you're always excited about? You, know, you get a work order, you get a project or something you're always excited about. So how can we, you know, talk to the staff and bring more of those duties or tasks to them? Um, I, I formally call them high energy tasks, but uh, informally call them pet projects. You know, what, is there something, a project or an initiative or something that one of your staff wants to do that's been talking to you about uh, that may not necessarily be sort of directly in line with your duties, but is going to benefit the organization overall? And they're excited about it. You know, why not let them take that on? So two really uh, two uh, personal experiences. So one for big right? So one of the organizations I worked with, we had very complex projects, huge organization, complex projects, lots of challenges coming up and down. Uh, one of the things that really helped me maintain a positive mindset in the department, and I think food was one of the primary factors of this. Uh, you know, once a week at or once in two weeks when we got the paycheck, we would just go to donuts or breakfast or something. So everyone gets together in the break room, you're know, having that opportunity to talk, all of that. And then we would have potluck once a month. And uh, you know, one of the leaders organized it. And it was a great time just to unwind, de stress, talk, get to know the person outside of the work. And then you would actually see the effects of that reflect in work. Like you saw better performance, you saw better productivity. People were no longer tired, like you know, just stressed out mentally because of the complex projects. And no matter what sort of you know repairs you got, what sort of numbers, KPIs you saw, overall the work climate was just uh, really positive. Another thing when uh, you know we talk about pet projects, so one of the organizations again they had these derby race cars. So every year there was a competition organized by Mac at the gas station. And every team member or I mean every every individual person had to build their own derby cars. And in the biomed shop, obviously we had all the tools. So I myself I, I should have put that photo. I actually built a car that looks like a Ferrari and I used capacitors and transistors to make it look very jazzy and everything. And that was a complete team effort. You know, everyone got their hands dirty, started working on it, different things we learned. And a lot of those hands-on skills even help when you're repairing equipment. You sort of, even if you're in management, you tend to refresh your skills and then get that hands-on experience again. So overall, great project, non-HTM related, but then you saw the effects of that, the positive effects in HTM. We had um, team member appreciation week. That was like for the whole hospital um, a couple of months ago. And... I, I set aside like it was like an hour and a half the one like on the Wednesday in the middle of the week. I brought in uh, you know my my bags, cornhole or whatever you call it in this area. Um, brought in those. They had a they had a uh, like a NCAA where you have the brackets to do that. They had the thing where you like I put a whole bunch of Skittles in one of those jars and they had to guess how many were in there and the person would win this and that. Um, 
a few other like just and we had a lunch at two of course they made a potluck or something so little things like that were just the team appreciated they got just unwind and not think about work for like a little while i think when you see majority of the htm uh, you know, professionals they're all low maintenance <laughs> you know just like uh, burger fries you know some food and hungry some games it makes us happy we don't need anything fancy but what we do is we have your 30 at the end of the month Oh, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that came up for the hospital. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, that was a celebration that we survived the month uh, from one. And then if there's any birthdays or anniversaries, then I would always make a lemon and cheesecake. And then from that, it went to let's go have pizza and beer. So we go to one of the local growers. With, uh, 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 and then so we leave at 3, 3.30. So uh, we, we always make sure that if somebody's out in the field for you to come service, that they were back to make sure that they got to participate. So do you have people though that like either don't drink or that they can never make because they have to have family or kids or something like that? Um, I only had one person who was always claimed to have a stomach ache that day. And, uh, but I said, okay, then just stay at the office. I've actually been that person because so uh, one of the things that makes the inclusion again. I oh, you did during the day? Yeah, um, at three o'clock. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought one of my colleagues was always taking barbecue places and I'm a hardcore vegetarian. Mm -hmm. So I could never go and I would always say, you know, just not feeling great today or something. But over time, it took me a lot of courage to tell that I think you are selecting restaurants and there's absolutely nothing from there. So why don't we pick something that's a little bit more mm -hmm. inclusive, you know? Mm -hmm. And late on, something that worked with my team because I had dispatch of uh, the system applications, purchasing and receiving, and invoice which were all stressful, and finance accounting as well, and then a few technicians. Uh, thankfully, near our office itself, we had a new smash room. So basically, twenty dollars an hour, they give you a crate full of flowers and other items. All you do is just break. About you have a baseball bat and you just break things. You smash it and you break. And there's a like, girl you love music. And initially, I was very hesitant, suggesting that what if someone doesn't like you? Then, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. smash you. But that activity was just superb for me. It's like it's just total uh, unwinding stress. stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just after that, there's like a pizza and beer place. You go there, you know, talk to people, and it, it's become great. I and mean, there are so many people that you know, with friends outside of work as well. But I think before we move on, it's also important given. The topic of our presentation to, to recognize that some people may not want to participate in those after hours events. Mm -hmm. You know, recognizing that they just don't want to, but at the end of the day, you know, that you shouldn't hold that against them. It doesn't, it's not detrimental to the organization with them not to participate. Um, so, you know, it's great to organize these activities, but at the same time, it's also great to just recognize that it's a person. Come, they can't is, come. is that an issue with inclusion though? Because like I, I have I have a huge team, 17 people, and there's always some people that just don't want to or can't. And it's like, should we try to cater to them, or is there something that they're just like, I, just, I don't want to do it at all. I want to nine to five and go home. Yeah, yeah. And that's there's okay just some people well. that are like this. It's, it's nice to talk to the person and get them okay. You know, we want this. Some kind of some also that they yeah. go that mm -hmm. so, Exactly. So it's good to understand the background, like why are they saying no? Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, we just want you to know that one, we don't miss you. We respect your decision at the same time your team wants to go. Is there anything else that we can do that you would like to participate in? Well? Yeah. We used to. We used Probably to this lesson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Print out a bunch of pictures of your own face. Well, actually, my company is going to have apps throwing in uh, Amy, so. Oh, nice. Sure. <laughs> Yeah. So an interesting note, um, I think a lot of organizations with sort of large nursing structures have a shared governance committee. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but basically, you know, it's you, you have floor nurses that are represented in shared governance, and then they have the track line of communication for leadership about issues and, and just sort of can drive the direction of the organization. So we actually uh, adopted something similar where we had sort of shared governance and it was sort of like a social governance type thing. And we had representation from the different departments and sections and they were the ones who actually determined, you know, what we do socially after hours or, you know, where we're going to have pizza or bagels or potluck or whatever it was. So 
you know, we sort of put the onus back on the staff to say, you know, I, I know what I want, barbecue, yeah. but, you know, what do you guys want to do? Want to do salad, lunch, one time, or you know, what it is? So, again, yeah, making sure everyone has a voice to provide input, uh, that inclusivity, that, that equity when you're making decisions is the part. We actually had a community in my previous organization, and one of the things I got the chance to change was no leaders in that family. Because the moment there was a leadership presence, the people were not voicing their opinions properly, right? And especially when you're planning social activities, you want everyone's opinions. And that wasn't happening. We had a mix, you know, text. We had admin professions, everyone. And the moon out to be great, it was a great job. This also relates to another issue that we've seen in the field, and that kind of comes back to retention as well. So, you know, one of the other organizations I worked, we had a technician with a three or four years experience that was interested to go into a supervisor. And then there was another lead tech was like, I think, 15 something experience that never wanted to be a manager at all, didn't want to manage people, was just happening with that. But then the leader wanted to actually promote the lead tech, push them into a managerial position, and then thought that the person within three, four years was not up to the mark. So, you know, those are uh, areas where you have to respect that employees, that individuals, uh, you know, outlook and understand do they even want to be the role or is it just something that we don't want to do? Uh, you want to time check? It's 3.30. Oh, it's 3.30. Yeah, that's the I beginning of things, well. of things. I know we talked a lot about diversity in the Portland. Uh, LinkedIn is big. Uh, again, I think a lot of my jobs have been over LinkedIn and industry events itself. In fact, last two AMEs is when I interviewed. So, uh, but otherwise, you know, career fairs. Yeah, I, I can. I have a quick story about career fairs. So, um, I have tried very hard to build relationships with schools in my region, uh, both tech trade schools and universities. And we have a uh, there's a national new and recent grad program, TCF program. Um, and we just got the applicant pool uh, back from recruitment from this past semester. So the schools I recruited at represented 7% of the schools in the entire national applicant pool. The number of applicants from those schools represented almost 20% of the applicants. So the schools I had relationships with were represented three times the average amount that schools represent. So, um, I think that's a pretty good leading indicator of results from doing outreach and having relationships with those schools. Um, so if there's ever sort of any doubt about doing outreach or the worth of not spending that time, I think that's pretty clear um, about the value of having those relationships. I think one really important to have relationships with the actual teachers. Yeah. Where we got all of ours. <laughs> and, and, you know, and to, to hark back to what I was saying about when I do outreach, I find a lot of people don't know the field that includes the teachers so if the teachers are now aware of the profession and the industry and you have that relationship with them you know, they now know to point certain students your way or you know if they see people who are interested in technology but maybe not pre-med or whatever it is they have that idea oh you know there's hdm so you know another advocate there in the field if, if they know about the field I, I have to say this because Vincent's in the room. Uh, you know, going to college, and I didn't know much about the HTM field myself, but there were three people who had read about in different you know, papers, peer-reviewed articles, Vincent, Malcolm Ridgeway, and then uh, Gary Gray. And all three of them like pioneers in our field, right? And uh, starting off in HTM and later getting the chance to meet them, uh, work with ACC or AIM, it was like kid in a candy store. It's like, hey, you actually studied, you learned about the field of healing, uh, you know, the works of these people, and now you're getting the opportunity to learn with them, work with them, and that's what you get with your HTM chapters and trade organizations. Uh, pretty much everyone I know, Nagar, you know, Vincent, because everyone, that's the full industry engagements. So, you know, that's something that you want to encourage, and I know often, uh, most organizations, it's only like membership is only for managers, anyone in leadership, not the, you know, techs. But I think, you know, we just need to expand that uh, scope and include our technicians and everyone pretty much in the department that may be interested. We did talk about it, so I'm going to skip since, you know, we are uh, short of time. Key takeaways, you know, obviously we've talked about creating that culture. 
and uh, making sure that at least as leaders, managers, supervisors, we have to deal with a lot of nuances around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So find out what uh, you know coursework, what training, what awareness programs your organizations have. Pretty much all uh, health systems have DEI committees, work groups. So get involved, get some uh, you know awareness training for your teams. Again, learning about inclusive language. You know, we heard a lot during you know, Brian's presentation downstairs. It's like, hey, I'm sorry you feel that way versus, you know, I, I, I really feel that way. Please forgive me or something like that. Actually, you take responsibility for your actions. So there's a lot of that leader team member communication as well where in HTML we can show a lot of that inclusive. And second, decision making. I asked him about how you roll out the process. Having that diverse decision making, collective opinions, and that also relates to creating a safe, comfortable space for your team members and making sure everyone's aware of. I'd like to quick comment about that. So when we were planning, <laughs> I, I said, Priya, you know, the irony of the white male doing a, a presentation on diversity is not lost. <laughs> she said, that is a form of bias. Yes. You know what? Why? What is keeping you from being an advocate and talking about your experience? So, good point. I, you know, thank you, Bria, for bringing that up. I think another thing, and I do want to appreciate you on that, was um, when we decided to do this. So initially, I had uh, put in this proposal and got accepted, and I was you know doing that. And then later on, we got involved in the ABDI committee. It just happened with the flow. And then I said, you know, it'll be useful to actually have a male perspective. So it was my bias as well. And I said, Lucas, you're in the area. Let's actually present. And we got him. And one of the things he noticed and he pointed out was, hey, you know, you submitted the presentation, everything, but they had my name and photo of first. And yours came later. And it was actually the first time, until then, I didn't think about it. And then later on, I thought, oh, maybe because I'm a vendor or something. And then it turned out to be just an alphabetical issue. <laughs> but then it was actually, I've not seen any individual that would, you know, identify those elements. It's very few. And I'll tell you, as female, Professions, a lot of time we hesitate to raise concerns because you don't want to come off to assert their word. Yes. I, I called Priya. I was like, who do I need to call to get this fixed? Because <laughs> and you is... called me like three, four times. So then I was worried. It's like anyone calls you after two times, I kind of get anxiety. I'm like, did I do something? Why are they calling me so many times? But, um, that actually helped me stand up for one of the things with Madhur because I know we had talked about the presentation and I didn't see my name. I'm like, Maybe I'm going, I'm going to stand up. Sort of help there. <laughs> so just to finish off, uh, we're actually uh, doing this uh, effort at Amy. We have a work group that's focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Again, the purpose of the group is not to uh, you know, change ratios or build some metrics, all of that in the field, or even improve the survey results. But it's one to identify what is the current state of our community when it comes to DEI. And then how can we create awareness about the field in different populations, different uh, you know communities? So some of the associations, it's a whole lot. I'll have to remember or mm -hmm. Google what they stand for. But uh, you know, there's Hispanic Association of uh, Health Professionals, National Black Health Professionals, there's STEM students in Hispanic and African American or Native American uh, communities, all of that. And what we're really doing is using that HTML in a box presentation to, you know, introduce the field to different communities. And then, surprisingly, there's a lot, a lot of folks that are IT oriented or are tech savvy, they're interested in. You know, it's actually striking some interest in the HTML. So some outcomes that we're expecting from the group, I think, we need to finish by the AME conference in June, is one has some visibility of the field in different populations. Uh, we'll also put together a blog focusing on some DEI aspects, and then we're planning to do a cover story in Amy featuring you know, diverse professionals and some of the members that we've talked to in these associations, and then talk about what they are doing in diversity, how we can improve it in uh, HTML as well. So you know, kudos to the group for getting involved. This is things that people have done voluntarily uh, outside of their work hours. And uh, you know, it's really great to collaborate with different like-minded folks. <laughs> so that's about it. Really, thank you. Thank you.